as if that, to say, oh, Labour's not really... I don't know why you had balloons suddenly come up. <laughs> for, for, any, for any of our podcast, our podcast viewers on YouTube, as, I don't know if this is a celebratory thing you've got on your Zoom that as soon as SMP lose a seat, you have balloons. But for, <laughs> for, our, for, our, for our listeners, they're probably wondering what's going on there. But yeah. Hello and welcome back to the Lib Dem podcast. You wait a long time, well, a week for a podcast, then two come in a day. So we are back because we've had just had a chat here at the Midbeds by-election. For those of you who are listening and not watching, I am right in the middle of the by-election HQ, so you'll hear all sorts of chats going on, people writing letters and welcoming them into the HQ before they go out canvassing. So that's what the noise is, if you're wondering. But we are delighted to be joined by two first-timers on the podcast um, who are going to talk all things Scotland, because as much as this English like to pretend that we know everything that's going on across the border, we don't. And so we want to hear it straight from two very well-informed gentlemen. So first up, we have Neil Alexander, the leader of the Moray Lib Dems. Hello, Neil. Welcome to the podcast. Hi John, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm Neil Alexander, I'm the leader of the Murray Liberal Democrats and I'm also the recently appointed spokesperson for Sport and Culture. Wonderful, and our, our new other guest is John Ferry. Hello John, welcome to the podcast. Hi John, thanks so much for having me. And uh, what, what's your role within the party there John? So I'm the Scottish Liberal Democrats finance spokesperson, so I, although I'm not assisting in Hollywood as an MSP, um, I, I kind of shadow the finance m- uh, minister uh, who's in the Scottish government as best I can. And um, aside from that, I've been a, a, a Westminster candidate twice for Dumfrieshire Claysdale and Tweeddale in 2017-2019, sort of flying the flag there in the south of Scotland, where I live. I'm based in the Scottish borders in a little town called Peebles. Um, yeah, and that's me. Brilliant. And so normally, you know, we want people, the, the phrase is to talk about the price of fish. As a finance guy, we are not going to ask you about the price of motorhomes or anything to do yeah. with that. But it, it does lead into what we're going that to could talk be about. Dangerous. But, yeah, absolutely right. I confirm but, I've got none up here either, to be honest. <laughs> but let's go talk about it. So, Neil, let's go to the result last night, because as most of our listeners will know that the, the election last night in Rutherford and Hamilton, they it happened massively. Massive win for Labour, but let's just go through the figures. What were the actual figures on the doors? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we have first in the place, in first, oh, sorry, in first place in Rutherglen and Hamilton, we have Labour on 58%, up 24%. Second, SNP on 28%, down 16%. Third place, the Conservatives on just 4%, massive loss of 11% there. And then we have Lib Dems on 4% and the Greens on 2%. So, I suppose, first out the bat, Neil, what are your impressions of that? I mean, it's clearly a stonkered win for Labour. Well, from the people I've spoken to, it sounds like, yeah, it's been a massive Labour victory, but even exceeding their own expectations. Like, I had a bit of a punt just talking with my partner and saying that we probably win about, well, Labour would probably win by about 15%. But it's just completely outweighed, I think, everybody's expectations to see them winning by the margin that they've won by. It's, it's, it's actually really incredible, and it's been a complete rejection of the SNP and the Conservatives, it's got to be said there. Is that your impression, John? So, yeah, so so I think um, the general expectation from people in the know was that Labour were almost certainly going to win this. Um, you know, uh, we, we had an excellent candidate, Gloria Adebo, but, um, you know, clearly for us, we were, we were never really in contention. Um, but it was important to have someone on the ballot paper that Liberal Democrats could vote for. And it was also uh, important for us to get out on the doors there and build up support for the future as well, especially for the future council elections which will come later this decade. Um, but for those in the know, it was definitely clear that Labour were almost certainly going to win for a number of reasons, uh, uh, big trends, the, the, the wave of populism starting to go out and so on. The really the surprising thing was the... Um, the extent of the win that we got, the, the, the massive swing, 24% swing towards Labour, um, destroying a 5,000 majority for the SNP. So the, the extent and the size of that swing, which obviously won't be replicated in a general election, but it's still seen as a really significant turning point in Scottish politics overall. 
maybe a once in a ten year turning point. So what, what were behind those? I mean, Neil, go for it. I mean, obviously we had all sorts of scandals regarding Margaret Fair and the fact it went to a recall petition, which kind of dragged on the scandal more. But that seems it seems to be more than just that has hit the SNP. Absolutely, I think there was a lot of personal affiliation with Nicola Sturgeon, and when she resigns, it it was like the straw that broke the camel's back. I mean, looking at Rutherford and Hamlet, I've been up and campaigning in Tain when we had the by-election there, a much more rural area compared to Central Belt with Rutherford. And we went from third place to the strong second place, taking second place completely from an SNP presence, and we're now the largest share of any of the parties in that ward. It's incredible seeing just how much the SNP is collapsing in terms of their hope from and I think it comes back to scandal after scandal and mismanagement, like John was saying. Um, things like the ferries don't get forgotten. Things like the council tax, uh, sorry, local council cuts don't get forgotten. And then there's also a bit of a threat of council tax rises going on in the background as well. Yeah. The other thing to keep in mind here is that when you look at polling of what Scots, um, what's at the front of Scots, Scottish people's minds when it comes to voting, what they want to see from the politicians. The constitutional question in independence is way down the list. So typically, any polling that's done, you'll find um, health, the economy, education, right at the top of people's priorities. The cost of living crisis, obviously, um, that's, that's probably the number one priority for people just now. And yet the independence, the, sorry, the, the SNP, um, Attached, attaching their campaign continuously to the idea of independence, that's no longer working for them. And for them to be popular and win support, they have to maintain a framework of our politics being based on the constitutional question. And that's what our arguments are about, and that's what people are concerned about. That's going now. That's the fundamental change, I think, that's happening. And we're seeing um, our politics in Scotland start to move back onto the left-to-right spectrum and away from things like national identity as a driver of politics. And that's um, that's seriously bad news for, for the SNP structurally. So they're going, to find, they're going to find things much more difficult for them going forward, now, as well as lots of ancillary things like Humza Yusuf just isn't, as, as Neil said, he's just not as popular as, um, or as talented as Sturgeon or Salmond was. Um, he's struggling to, to, meet, to, to gain real credibility in part just his party's rhythm of splits and so on. Um, so there's lots of other lessons, but I think the fundamental thing is that across Britain we're seeing a kind of great moderation take place just now. And despite what we saw at the Tory party conference this week, with horrible speeches from Sorella Braverman and so on, the Tories are almost certainly going to get voted out next year. And that's part of this trend towards our democracy starting to pull us back from the fringes and as we moderate again and become more reasonable. And that's bad news for a party, a nationalist, a populist nationalist party like the SNP. I kind of have to agree there as well with John. I think it should be the Conservatives up here with Douglas Ross should be concerned just how badly they are losing. I mean, you're talking about a seat where in 2017 they had 20% of the vote. Now they have four. That's just two elections. And they can say there's a lot of factors and say it's people turning away from the SNP, but it's not. The Conservatives are being rejected in by-elections across the country as well, and it's the pair of them that are on their last sort of their last kind of wheels, but before the spoke finally comes off. It's also well, important how... to remember. Sorry, John. I was going to say it's also important to remember how that this was a result in a particular area of the country, urban, just outside Glasgow, um, which is Labour traditionally Labour heartland, sort of became SNP heartland, and. and and the swing between eight, Labour and SNP now, that was never going to be Conservative heartland or any time soon Liberal Democrat heartland. But the next general election is going to be kind of defined by um, targeted approaches in different areas. And that's where we mm. come in and can and can actually do really well. So there's some areas uh, like Eastern Bartonshire, which is also a Glasgow seat, but it's very different from, from South Lanarkshire. Um, that's really in contention for us now. And this... Uh, uh, the result of this and the, the difficulty the SNP is, ha- is having works really well or favours favours us I think in that seat and also the other one is Ross Guy and Lacaber um, uh, Highland seat and an island seat 
very different from Glasgow, but it's, it's it was a traditional heartland of, of, of the Liberal Democrats and we're probably quite well placed to win that one back as well. And I suppose what, what many people, both in Scotland and in the rest of the UK, wonder is how much can we transfer this result to the general election next year? Because obviously it's really important to know, so this seat has actually changed hands. You know, it went back to Labour in 2017 and SNP took it back in 2019. So it's not yeah. one that's been Conservative for 200 years like we've seen with some of these other by-elections. But by-elections themselves are, in, are a funny beast and we've seen it in the victories we've had that, you know, sometimes opposition parties can coalesce behind a particular candidate and whether that is happening, is that shift or is that kind of breaking down now, that whole unionist versus, um, you know, uh, I was going to say nationalist, but that, that you know what I mean, in terms of that kind of... It. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Um, in terms of, you know, are now people who are pro-independence willing to vote Labour or one of the other parties because that that link is now being broken through scandal, SNP incompetence or whatever, is how much does the central belt of Scotland going to switch back to Labour from this? And, other, and then, as you mentioned, other seats that well, where the Lib Dems might be beneficiaries. I think, like you were just, uh, sorry, John was just saying there, it's the effort and the campaigning on the ground, and we're seeing it in Eastern Barnshire. I've been along to Ross Guy and Lock Harbour with Angus MacDonald, and the campaign run there has been really, really positive, and the amount of doors we're knocking is getting through quite a lot, and there's still a year to go. I think, don't get me wrong, it's a brilliant win for Michael Shanks and Labour down in Ireland. There's no doubt about it. You've got to give a tip the hat to them. Just like Gloria, um, her candidate, a really positive campaign as well. It was really, really slickly run, and we can learn a lot from that it does seem to be the campaigning effort equals the result. And that's what matters. It's not an overarching fear uh, fear of Westminster or it's not like that nationalist agenda that's cutting through anymore. It is the more localised issues. It's the more things, our bread and butter, the things that people care about on the doorstep. And that's where we need to be making our effort. Mm. So so the big, the big challenge for Labour and actually for any a non-nationalist party has been to change the, as I said earlier, change the framing of our big questions in politics here in Scotland. Um, parties, we, we've been kind of trying proactively to change that framing for, for since 2014 and, and the um, uh, and, and the independence referendum. Largely unsuccessfully because lots of things have happened that have just kept that burning on. Like Brexit happened and then that was a, a rejuvenating factor for the SNP and they could bring the constitutional um, debate to the, to the front again. And it also benefited the Conservatives, by the way, as well, just as much as the SNP. But what's happened now is not, not so much as a result of what parties like Labour or the Lib Liberal Democrats have necessarily been doing, but I think there's a structural change, a fundamental structural change happening in Scotland now um, which will probably last for the next 10 years. You can maybe compare it to somewhere like Quebec um, back in the 90s when it almost became independent from Canada and, and the national question was front and centre of politics for many years, but then it dissipated uh, and people there was a fatigue element and people just got um, fed up with it and realised that there was more important things than whether I was a French Canadian or a Canadian Canadian or whatever, however they defined it. French-speaking Canadian versus non-French-speaking Canadian. Um, that I think something similar is kind of happening in, in, in Scotland now, and um, uh, the terms of the debate have, have fundament are fundamentally changing now, which means that the ground is shifting beneath the feet of the nationalist side um, in a way that they can't control and they can't therefore take the lead uh, on on framing. The, the kind of messaging and, and the, the the debate in, in general in, in the elections that they would like to that they, that they so easily did in the past, um, so so that can only be good for for Liberal Democrats and Labour in particular in Scotland. So how will the SNP respond? You know, because it actually it was weird enough because we did have some polling also come out today that I know we talked about Humza Youssef and you know what. Whatever you think of Nicola Sturgeon, she was an operator. She knew what she was doing. She came, I mean, the Scottish government, I have all sorts of very strong opinions on. Um, but you know what? Nicola Sturgeon did have a, maybe it was a false air of competence, but actually was a very good political operator. Now, Humza Youssef today is still, according to polling, pinch of salt, all the natural caveats, I think, far more liked than um, Anasawa. 
um, and is still more popular. I don't know if he's more popular than, than the, um, the SNP, because that's obviously a key thing we research for in British politics is, OK, how popular is Keir Starmer compared to the Labour Party or Rishi compared to the Tory party? But is how do SNP respond to this or do they go into a kind of a doom loop ready for the general election? Okay. Well, it's an interesting one. I was watching some of the kind of coverage earlier on and, to be fair, Stephen Flynn, the Westminster leader for the SNP, came out and held his hands up and said, we need to learn our lessons here. And to be frank, it could already be too late, if we're honest about that. But the, 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 there seems to be like this air that they're really focusing on the voter turnout from the by-election as if that, to say, oh, Labour's not really... I don't know why you had balloons suddenly come up. <laughs> for, for, any, for any of our podcast our podcast viewers on YouTube, as, I don't know if this is a celebratory thing you've got on your Zoom that as soon as SMP lose a seat, you have balloons. But for, <laughs> for, our, for, for our listeners, they're probably wondering what's going on there. But yeah, that's I mean, a, I mean, have you I'm, missed I'm, have you missed your girlfriend's like, birthday? Is this is what's no, no, not to the point. I really hope not. Uh, <laughs> SNP losing seats tends to have a party effect for some. Um, I know there was. So I think it's going to. I think it's going to be really interesting to see how the SNP respond to this because the party has clearly some pretty um, serious divisions within it just now, and some power plays happening. There's Kate Forbes who narrowly lost out to Hamza Yusuf on for, for party leader. She's clearly still on manoeuvres and waiting for her, biding her time to come back. Stephen Flynn, who Neil mentioned, clearly has ambitions um, as, as to be the leader of the SNP, but he doesn't have a seat at Hollywood. And I think under their current rules, he would have to get a Hollywood seat before he could be considered uh, a leader of the SNP. And then he'd be obviously be first minister then as well, if it was under, under the current parliament. So, so there's two players there who are clearly... Have a, have a future eye on leadership. And there's other ones in the fringes who might have an eye on leadership as well. Um, mm -hmm. Now, those those players are clearly going to be actually emboldened by this result today. So that's why Stephen Flynn was coming out and saying, being actually quite hard on and saying some some um, difficult truths, I guess, I think, because he's incentivized to do that in order to line himself up as a potential future challenger. I don't think Kate Forbes has said anything yet, but it'll be interesting to see how she responds. She, she was in the press last week, which was interesting. I think she did a column last week. So obviously, I think the SNP knew this was going a little bit sideways. This was not, I don't think this was an unexpected loss from the SNP. So I think Kate Forbes, instead of doing it after the event where it looks kind of obvious that she's political manoeuvring, has she just, just fired her shot a little bit beforehand? There yeah. was an article um, that she brought out with the Press and Journal, a very personal one. It is actually a very good read. Um, on postnatal depression um, but the, uh, the bit that was more probably interesting was there's the Fergus Ewing stuff going on, now, Fergus Ewing, the Ewing name up in this part of Scotland is very very famous, it's very popular amongst the SNP base the stuff that's going on with Fergus Ewing's rebellion seems to be dividing their campaign um, movement right down the middle like some people are very very just ex ex explain that to because actually to be absolutely mm -hmm. honest i'm not sure what you're referring to so i'm sure quite a lot yeah. of lib dems don't yeah, no, so no absolutely so, so fergus ewing is the son of winnie ewing famous snp figurehead he's the msp for inverness and nairn um and basically recently he's been very anti the snp and green coalition and government he's been voting against things like the deposit return scheme um, he voted in favour of the vote of no confidence of Lawrence Slater, the Green Minister. So there's been quite active rebellion from him. Um, and last week he got suspended from the SNP group for a week. He came out and he's opposing that. But in the most interesting part of it, that in the press conference with it, he was flanked by Kate Forbes. So the leadership contender, after this person was kicked out by Humza Yusuf's group, is flanking and showing a sign of support with mm. Ergus Ewing. So, so they're, 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 the right, they're the right wing part of the SNP. The Tartan um, Tories. Yeah, mm. exactly, yeah. And it'll be interesting to see whether the um, the extent of this swing towards Labour encourages those splits to to, to, come, to come out a bit more and, and what impact that has on the SNP. The other interesting thing is they've got their autumn conference coming up in a few weeks' time. Um, and at that autumn conference, the Jew, as always, to debate independence again. And Hamza Yusuf is in a, a difficult position where he 
he has to kind of throw a bit of red meat to his base, to 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 the kind of um, more extreme elements within the SNP that everything's about independence and when are we going to have a plan for another indirect and, and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and he's got this crazy idea just now that uh, I think it's if the SNP win a majority of Scottish seats at the next Westminster general election, then he's going to open up negotiations on independence with the UK government. So even if they lose a bunch of the current MPs and become a smaller party at Westminster, apparently he's going to turn up at Downing Street and start negotiating the breakup of the UK. Do, doesn't is... that just look desperate, though? That's the point. And, it, and again, it kind of adds to that distraction element that you can throw at the SNP. Yeah, well, that's it, it looks... yeah. sorry. It's a, as we say, yeah, it, it does look desperate. Um, he's trying to kind of keep the can, keep, keep kicking the can along the road as much as he can, which was what Nicola Sturgeon did, to be fair. And, and so she ran out of roads and then ultimately stepped down. He's just trying to do the same. He is the continuity candidate. Um, but uh, but this by election result and the and the, the 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 sense that people now have around the SNP is being in decline makes it tricky for him to to do that. That the um, uh, at this upcoming conference, and there'll be pressure on him to maybe just take that, be honest with people, and say, "Look, it's not independence isn't going to happen anytime soon. We need to knuckle down and just try and be a good government for a while." Um, or whether he keeps keeps up this pretense that, "Yeah, if we just if if, if there's one more push about to come, and, and I'm the person to deliver it, and we'll, we'll force the UK to the negotiating table." which is nonsense. So some really interesting reverberations coming out from this um, by-election result today and in the, the coming weeks and months it'll be really interesting to see how the SNP uh, responds to it. Meanwhile, all in the back yeah. you have Alex Salmon's controversial from Alba Party, who are to be honest, more extreme independents now, no matter what election results are going. So if there's enough activists in the SNP who will want to see something there to want to see some sort of progress being made by Hamza Youssef. And with that on the background, who are being very critical of the independence movement at the moment, there's a lot to lose for Hamza Youssef and the SNP. Right and, and I wonder if this if this dam has burst a little bit from, you know, it was that whether Liz Truss did it for the Tories in terms of that competence. Once you lose it, it's gone. And actually, as you saw things from people like, is it Mari Black that's announced she'll be stepping down? There's this kind of thing that they are past their peak and the only way is a little bit down. And even if the general public, which aren't as nauseous as we are about as about politics, but the sense that the SNP is on a little bit of the slide, okay, and then what comes next becomes the question. And once you have that narrative going into an election, it can be very difficult to turn that around. So is that something that you think the general population is feeling in Scotland? Well, from the door knocking I've done in all the areas up in the north of Scotland, people are looking for something to turn to. That's the, the hard truth of it. Um, I do a lot of local surveys, and the, the prevalent answer, the, the one, number one answer, isn't, oh, I'm voting for this person. It's, I don't know who I'm going to vote for in the next election. I might be in favour of independence or against it, but am I sold on Hamza Yusuf's SNP or Douglas Ross's Conservatives? No, not really. So it is a bit about what is next. You're absolutely right. Yes, and I mean the the SNP have been in power now for sixteen years, so there were children potentially leaving school this year who were born just as the SNP were coming into to government. Um, so it's very difficult for them. Even the only reason they've lasted sixteen years is because they kept having the constitutional question to fall back on and drum up support that way. But there's definitely a sense that they're kind of running out of road now on all fronts. Can't see what possible messaging. Hamza Yusuf could go into a general election with next year um, that's going to be salient and, and will get people's attention and, and um, energise uh, campaigners and everything else. It, it, he's, he's going to have to go in with something on independence again. No one's really going to buy it. So it, it's, it's, I think, a bit of a death spiral, potentially. And one thing I'm, I'm curious about, just going returning to the by-election, is actually how hard did the SNP work? Because, again, this is something that, you know, we do, I mean, a lot of people even who are outside of the by-election campaign and don't know exactly the effort it takes to win a, a parliamentary by-election. So were Labour just it ruthless, do everything at it? Were, were, were the SNP realised they were losing and kind of rode back a little bit? Was their candidate any good? All these kind of questions. I mean, what were your impressions on the ground, Neil? 
from well being in the north of scotland it's a wee bit a wee bit remote from it but from what i've seen and from what i've heard when i've been speaking to some of the organizers down there they've seemed much more focused on what the labor candidate is than what their candidate is i mean it doesn't take a big doom scroll through twitter to see the snp talking about labor being a branch office or attacks on keir starmer which seems like they've already started to come away from their message of independence so personally i think they probably spent far too much time worrying about michael shanks than worrying about katie Lydell. yeah i think i think there was a general feeling that um they knew from the start that they were going to lose um the green party put up a candidate the green party is obviously in in government with um the smp and they're very close to the smp to the point of almost becoming like a single party. I, if, if the SNP thought they had any chance at all of winning there, I think they would have, would have had a word with the Greens not to put up a candidate and not um, water down the nationalist vote. So, I, I, yeah, I think there was definitely a sense that they, they knew, they, they had to go through the motions of pretending that they were they, they, had, they were in with a chance uh, in this, but they kind of knew they weren't. And I did see some stuff online where... Um, uh, SNP, MSPs and MPs had to really be um, forced to go and do a bit of campaigning there because no one wanted to go and campaign. So <laughs> it's a bit of, it, it was pretty dismal for them from the start, I think. So Talk that's, that with you. The, the SNP are anti-zero hour contracts and apparently they were offering zero hour contracts for people to go and campaign for them. <laughs> well, yeah, okay. Yeah, well, Desperate. to deliver leaflets, I think it was. I think it was to yeah. deliver leaflets, but not yeah. Canvas. I think that's the yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's end on a positive note from a Lib Dem point of view because we've talked about Labour, we've talked about the SNP, about what this means for the Lib Dems up in Scotland because, you know, we forget how how, maybe not in this particular area of Scotland, but actually how important Scotland is to the Lib Dems as well. So I, I imagine all of our MPs at the moment are probably thinking, okay, if the SNP threat is on a slight diminution, that's good. You know, taking seats like Eastern Bartonshire, obviously look at well, feel a lot more attainable with the SNP having collapsed. But what are your final impressions about what this means? I'll go to you first, John, What for what this means for the Lib Dems going forward in Scotland. Mm. So I think as a... So to touch on earlier, I think Scotland is starting to move back onto the left to right wing spectrum and away from a spectrum to do with identity and, 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 and other things. Um, and that can, can only fundamentally be good for the Liberal Democrats. Um, over the last 10 years, when people have been voting in elections purely on the basis of the Constitution, the Lib Dems have been squeezed out because... The Conservatives have t- tended to monopolise and much of, apart from in particular areas, the Conservatives have tended to monopolise much of the anti-SNP vote in the south of Scotland, for instance, where I am. They've certainly done that, and this used to be a Lib Dem stronghold at one point. Um, and the SNP obviously have, have monopolised the, um, the, the the pro-nationalist vote, with the Greens helping them overall to do that, and they've worked the Hollywood system in a way so that. Um, uh, they can maximise the nationalist uh, number of MSPs in the parliament. Um, so moving away from that, moving back on to traditional politics, if you like, I would say a normal politics where we actually talk about the real issues, social justice, social injustice, um, who should pay more, who should pay, who, who should be helped more, etc. Crime and punishment, all, all these sorts of issues. The the that getting back to that kind of politics, that being at the front of people's minds when they're voting, that can only be good for the Liberal Democrats. So um, we're obviously not as big a party in Scotland as, as Labour. We're not going to sweep up across Glasgow, but in particular areas, we, we, we're definitely going to do well. And, and there's a lot of potential to to build back in areas where we've done well in the past. And, and in the last 10 years, we haven't done that well. Neil, Neil final word from yourself to wrap up this episode. Uh, no pressure, man. I, to be honest, like I've been doing most of this episode, uh, I completely agree with John. There's opportunities there. I've, I'm going to go back to my point earlier. It's pretty much just about putting the effort in. I mean, we can learn from Michael Shanks and the campaign there and take that into our target areas for sure. And there is an opportunity for us to grow. And that's the important thing from a lived perspective. But it's, like, it's probably there's a it's a good time to get involved in Scottish politics, especially from that Lib Dem perspective, because the opportunity is coming. 
and maybe that's what's one of the big things is it, momentum is a huge thing in politics and actually belief that a change is coming uh whether that's in up in holyrood up in the, uh, the scottish parliamentary seats or the country as a, as a whole that is actually a really powerful thing to get your activists going and your donations coming in and whatever else you need as a party to succeed. So thank you so much, Neil. Thank you so much, John, for coming on. I mean, brilliant first outing on the podcast, can we say? We usually don't allow people that do so well to come back because it makes us regulars look terrible. But no, it, we really appreciate you coming on, particularly at very short notice after the by-election result. Um, for all our listeners and viewers who want to follow these two fine gentlemen, I will link their social media uh, profiles profiles in the uh, in the episode description uh, and we'll be back with more episodes so do subscribe to us on youtube do uh, follow us on all our social media and if you're really kind because this podcast is completely done independently it's not done by the hq so if you want to join patreon and give us a few pound every month that really helps us keep it going um, but that's enough of the sales pitch for me go out and knock on doors or even better come to mid beds if you can so thank you neil thank you john and we'll be back with another episode very soon